I absolutely love the mobile space and the possibilities tablets like the iPad have to offer. We're at a point where tablets can perform tasks that were usually reserved for desktops. On top of that, the workflows have improved so much that it's now easy to start something on the iPad and continue that work on the computer. It's really refreshing to see. So with that in mind, I decided to work on a small 3D project that will utilize both the iPad and the iMac. The plan is to model an object on the iPad and then set up and render that object on the desktop. To do that, I'll use two of my favorite apps, Shaper 3D on the iPad and Cinema 4D on the Mac. So, let's get started. Since I'm still figuring things out, I don't want to go with a crazy complex project. By keeping things simple, I won't have to troubleshoot a hundred different things that might also be relevant to the project. So I want to go with a model that is relatively simple, but nice looking enough to keep me interested in the project and not abandon it uh, midway through. I started looking through different illustration books and websites to get some inspiration, and as it turns out, I didn't have to look for too long. This is a sketch from an artwork book for Toy Story 4. I'll leave the link of the book in the description below. It's a really beautiful book with models, sketches, and storyboards from the movie. I don't remember if the character actually shows up in the movie, but that's irrelevant. What matters is how incredibly cute this little guy is. Since I don't have any blueprints of the character, I need to first figure out the proportions. And it's better to do that before having any 3D objects. Working on the 2D shapes first allows us to get a feel for the overall mass and proportions. I'll still adjust things when I get to the 3D shapes, but for now 2D will work just fine. The modeling process is quite straightforward. There are no real complex shapes. Most of them are a result of extrusions, lathing operations, and then some chamfering and beveling. As a matter of fact, I can show you how the different parts were built in a matter of seconds. Of course, modeling the whole object took longer than that, but instead of going through the whole modeling process, I think it would be more beneficial if I shared with you all the gotcha moments I've stumbled on or other workflow tips or issues I faced. There are two key things I took away from this project. Procedurality is a bit more difficult to maintain in Shaper, and things can take longer to model. Let me explain. In Shaper 3D, you reach a point where you need to commit to a change in order to move along the modeling process. We can stay as procedural as we can in Cinema. There are ways to go around it, but by doing that, you will have to spend more time managing multiple objects and maintaining a clean hierarchy. So you need to find the right balance between keeping things flexible, but not also wasting a lot of time in maintaining that procedurality. Let's take as an example the head shape. Of course, we can adjust the shape around as much as we want, but once we go into the beveling process, there's no way back. We're fully committed to the shape. So if at some point we realize that we just need to adjust the overall shape of the head a little bit, make it wider or shorter, we cannot do anything about it. If I move any of these faces around, the shape will be deformed in unexpected ways. Of course, like any other application, it's a good working habit to commit to detailing only at the very last point. But at the same time, it's good to have the tools necessary to adjust things if we somehow messed up. If I built this shape in Cinema and I had to then adjust things around, it would be a very simple task. We can marquee select the points we want to move around and just adjust things accordingly. Shaper 3D is missing that ability, and I think it would be very beneficial if they implemented something similar, a way to just grab a specific area of the object and move it around. We can always duplicate the object and store a copy of it somewhere in the workspace, but the more objects you have, the more crowded and complicated it gets to maintain and manage these copies. Now with that out of the way, let's focus on another thing I've noticed. It took quite a bit of time to model the object. Just longer than I expected. Not because modeling in Shaper 3D is slow, but because some modeling operations slow down the entire modeling process. Let's take beveling as an example. In simple cases like this cylinder, it's really fast and easy to chamfer or fill it an edge. Once though the shape gets a bit more complex, we need to define which edges we want the beveling to apply on. 
Selecting these edges can be incredibly time consuming. Let's take this simple example. We just want to bevel this area here. We need to go through and select all the corner edges first and then apply the beveling. Even though this is a relatively simple case, it still takes quite a bit of time to go through and select all the edges required. Imagine now having a larger and more complex object. It will require a lot more zooming in and out, rotating things around, and so on and so forth. It's just incredibly tedious to do, especially considering the fact we usually won't have just one object to detail. In other 3D programs like Cinema, something like that is incredibly fast. It's just a matter of a loop selection and then applying the right bevel. If the Shaper team created some sort of loop selection ability, it would make the whole modeling process incredibly fast. It really is one of the few sticking points I have with the app. At some point I was considering of doing all the beveling operations on the desktop, but it felt like cheating, so instead I just chugged along, making every single beveling and chamfering operation the tedious way. To add insult to injury, there's another small annoying thing that has to do with how easily we can lose these edge selections. Thankfully, things have improved since the earlier version, so now if we misclick, we don't lose the selection anymore. We can just undo and get back the selection. But if we were to perform a function like chamfer and we either change our mind or wanted to fill it instead, when we undo, the selection is completely lost. So now we need to go back and make the selection all over again. It happened to me a few too many times and I must say it wasn't fun. The solution to these issues is incredibly simple, so I'm confident that things will improve in the future, but for now, keep in mind that there are some silly limitations in place. If Shaper would always preserve selections when undoing, allow for loop and ring selections, and have a system to save these selections like in Cinema, the whole modeling process would be a breeze. Another quirky little bit with uh, Shaper is that in some fringe cases, the tools change the way they work. Let's take the robot eye as an example. What I would like to do here is grab this bit and make an inner extrusion. But because of the way the shape is modeled, it's not possible to do it like we're used to. Here I can just grab this bit and extrude. If I try to do the same thing here, the extrusion won't happen. So you assume that extruding the surface is not possible, but it actually is. We just need to go about it a different way. We need to select the extrude command and then the extrusion will work. So if for some reason a tool is not doing what you expect it to, try to see if there's a workaround to get to the result you need. But enough about the modeling part, we still have quite a few more things to figure out. Let's see how we can transfer our model to cinema and get it to render. We have two ways to approach this. We can either export the model as an IGES file or as an OBJ. IGES requires minimum setup in Cinema and everything is readable exactly the same way as in Shaper, but I found out that the edges are not maintained in a nice way, so I went with the reliable and often used OBJ format. I'm sure there's a setting or two I missed in Cinema's importer, but I feel more comfortable with OBJ. So I guess what they say is true, you cannot teach an old dog new tricks. Now if we go ahead and import the model without any adjustments, you'll see several issues from the get-go. The object is upside down and it's also incredibly tiny. As you can see, we have a couple of things to sort out. So first things first, let's figure out the scale and the axis system. I'll first create this simple scene with these two cubes, one next to the other. One is 10 centimeters tall and the other is 5 centimeters tall. Now let's bring in this scene to cinema with the default OBJ settings. Instead of 10 centimeters, the cube is 0.1 centimeters. So that means we need to multiply the scale by 100. As far as the axis system, we can easily see through the axis widgets of both programs that Shaper is using a different axis orientation. So that means we need to flip the Z and Y axis. So let's close the document again reopen it and input the correct settings. So on the scale settings in the pop-up dialog, we need to multiply by 100. So we'll put 100 centimeters here and instead of flip Z axis, we will check swap Y and Z. Now let's check again. Everything seems to be correct, but we have one more issue to solve. If you notice, the cubes are merged into one object and we definitely do not want that. We need to be able to adjust the materials per object. 
Thankfully, there's an easy solution for that, and it lies in the OBJ import dialog. So let's import once again, and the solution to our problem is this option here, the splitting area. Instead of by object, we will select split polygon groups. Now that we have the correct settings, let's save it as a preset so we won't have to adjust settings every time we import a shape or object. Now let's hit OK and check again. The scale and axis system are now all correct, and if we expand this object, we see two objects. Perfect. Now let's load our robot character and enable our preset from the dropdown. Everything works as expected, but there's one more thing to deal with. As you can see, the axis center is off for all objects, but there's an easy fix for that. We can adjust that easily by using the axis center command. So just select all objects, hit the execute button here, and we're all set. Now each object has its axis in its center. The object names have also transferred properly, and if I was <laughs> tidy and organized when working in Shaper, we would have had some nice names here in place, but I kind of prefer to do the organizing and renaming part in Cinema. One last thing I want to cover in the OBJ import process is material colors. In Shaper, we have the ability to color our objects, and I'm happy to say that we can also transfer that in Cinema as well. So, when we export the object from Shaper, we need to click on the advanced options here and enable include vertex colors. This will now include the colors we picked inside Shaper. When importing the object inside Cinema, we will only have one material imported. So things might look incorrect in the viewport, but we can just duplicate the material however many times needed, and then we just have to assign these materials to the objects. If for some reason we don't want to apply the material through a vertex map, we can just pick the color of the map with the color picker and then delete the vertex map shader from the material. I prefer to just do the materials straight inside Cinema, so I didn't bother doing that in Shaper, but it's good to know that we have the ability to transfer pretty much everything from Shaper to Cinema. Now that we have everything correctly set up, we just need to start preparing the materials and set things up for the final render. But before we do that, we need to address the huge <laughs> elephant in the room, the topology. As expected, it's cat topology, so things won't be that clean. We can use the untriangulate command and we can clean things up up to a point, but it won't be as clean as you might like. But to be honest, we're just going to render the object and we're not going to do anything fancy with it, so leaving the topology like this won't really make a difference. I used Redshift for the final render since it's an incredibly fast render and quite easy to set the materials up. I went for a toy-like stylized look. Colors weren't available in the sketch, so I picked up what I thought looked good. So. Without further ado, here's the final textured and shaded model. My final thoughts, a hybrid mobile desktop workflow is absolutely possible nowadays. Aside from a couple of hiccups and the modeling process, we can absolutely model something on the iPad and then move that to the computer and finalize things there. I know it's obvious that the technology has progressed quite a lot all these years, but it still feels kinda magical. If you would have told 15 year old me that in the future I would have a tiny thin computer in my hands powerful enough to model a 3D object, that kid would be totally blown away. The iPad and Shaper 3D combo make for a really enjoyable modeling process. With Shaper, the technical part of modeling fades away into the background, and now we can just focus on creating the model we have in mind. I love the fact that I can just sit down on my couch and start working on an idea without too much of a hassle. It's really fun. So, I would highly encourage you to start experimenting with your tablet and see how you can integrate it into your work. You might be surprised by the results. And with that, we've reached the end of this video. Let me know if you have any questions in the comments below and I'll do my best to answer them. Take care and I'll see you on the next one.